Welcome to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. Before we get started with the episode, I want to tell you about a new ebook available on our website called Buyer Beware. Why do they keep trying to sell you that annuity? This ebook covers the various types of annuities, negatives to owning annuities, and better investment alternatives to annuities. To download this ebook, you can click the link in the episode notes or go to wiserinvestor.com and you'll find it at the bottom of the page. Now on to today's episode. Welcome to a Wiser Retirement Podcast, where we believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith, guiding you to financial freedom today is my co-host, Brad Lyons. Hey, Brad. Hi, Casey. So we're um, already in our planning meetings, we're already starting to get a lot of um, conversation centered around the next election, which is not until 2024, but people are already getting amped up about it. Um, and also, we have a mix of... of uh, client base here that that we have uh pro trumpers already we have um, pro biden and i don't know if it's actually pro biden but okay with biden <laughs> not trump <laughs> we have that category um and, and obviously there uh, you know there's people that that have um other uh uh, other persuasions that may not actually make the right. make the ballot list. And well, we live in such a twenty four hour news cycle now. They're already filling it up with something that's going to occur in late twenty twenty four. Right. Yeah. Um, so it, it just kind of you know obviously elections are very important. Um, direction of the country is very important. But our job is to do financial planning and manage portfolios. And you know, really, Congress probably has more of an effect on planning uh, than the individual president would. Um, but you, you know, which is interesting because con- congressional approval rating is always like the lowest, right? But they're voting on the group, not an indiv- individual, right? Where the presidential approval is, you know, really based on it, one person, not, not, not. It's, vote, it's thought know. that, you know, everybody says, well, my guy or my gal is okay. Yeah. But the rest of them <laughs> are bottoms. The <laughs> bottoms, exactly. Um, but you know, there's been a lot going on. So I, I guess more recent news is the market volatility along with the debt ceiling right now. And, you know, really as investors, your risk is that the U S U S bonds um, get downgraded or the U S defaults on their debt. Right. Right. On their debt payments. Right. Yeah. And, and they've been downgraded before. Mm-hmm. And you know what happened after that? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, initially there is there is some fallout and some volatility, but right. you look back on it, what did it change? It changed nothing, right? I mean, essentially, you're you're paying, you're paying. People are see S and P is getting paid to rate bonds, right? Oftentimes, by the very people they're asking to be rated, right? There's a right. conflict of interest in the whole. <laughs> in the whole process. So so the worst case scenario right now is a, it looks like a debt ceiling deal is going to go through. Yes. Um, but the worst case to our portfolios is U.S. defaults, uh, doesn't pay its bills, and their credit rating gets downgraded. Um, and, you know, that probably... And they lose face in, in the international community. It, and and then that, when we go that would borrow be, again, they have to borrow at a higher interest rate. That would be a bigger course, Yeah, That would be a bigger issue. Exactly. But what's interesting is um, um, that there may be a winner here. Okay? And this, uh, uh, the, they seem to have come to at least an agreement in, in concept. Now it has to be voted on. This is where we're at, depending upon when our listeners are, are listening. Um, right. But there seems to be a, an agreement here. And... If, if that's the case, you have to think, who's the winner in all of this? And this is where it starts to get interesting, in my opinion. Okay, It's my thought that um, the, the American public you know, is much like the bell curve. Right. Okay. The vast majority of people are somewhere in the center. Maybe middle right, maybe middle, maybe middle left. But underneath the flares of that bell curve is where the hardcore ideologists exist, okay? They're also the loudest. <laughs> right. You know, they're the smallest, but the loudest. And right now, both of them are objecting to this agreement, right. which means the middle is going to have the greatest persuasion on all of this now. And we have something that we haven't had in quite some time, so we have 
the two sides actually meeting and talking to one another. And maybe they've come to an agreement and they, they can use this as a foundation for coming together for other things. Pushing aside both of the ideologues in the parties, okay? Right. And bringing the center together to get things done in the country. So there may be a winner. It may be. I, I think know. in the end, it, you know, you have a debt ceiling because basically we're spending, more, it's like a credit card limit. Yes. And you, know, you spent more than what your credit card can handle. So you call them up and say, hey, I need a bigger limit. <laughs> right. There's no payoff plan here. None whatsoever. None whatsoever. And when they, when they talk about these uh, reductions, what they're really saying is that it's not going to grow as much as we originally projected the, the debt to be. Right. So they say that this will reduce the deficit by one and a half trillion dollars over 10 years. But you really have to kind of turn that and say it won't grow. It'll grow one and a half trillion dollars less right. than it would have otherwise. Right. Yeah. It, and in the end, I don't know that if that even matters. Does it matter that we just keep borrowing and borrowing? It ultimately, we control our own currency. We were told a long time ago that if it just kept happening, bad things would happen. But they haven't. I mean, but they haven't. And at some point, you know, if you forecast out to like 2025 or uh, 2035, uh, you run the risk of like 70% of the budget just carrying debt and, and um, all of our programs, you know? Yes, and but it assumes a certain growth rate in the Correct. GDP. Yeah, and if we can exceed that, we can actually grow our way, not necessarily out of it, but through it. Through it, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Productivity is important. Productivity is one of the most important things. Yeah, if you so, can build more widgets with the same amount of you know cost as fewer widgets, you're going to have higher profits, and you know. So I mean, ultimately, I think there's a big question mark on that, but. You know, today's discussion is about the 2024 election. I think by the time we post this podcast, the debt ceiling will be handled. My prediction is it's it's going to be noisy, but it's going to something will get passed right. and it will be through it. And then the vault market will probably get a little bump because of it, because that that volatility is now behind us, and they'll find something else to worry about. Right. Um, you know, in prepping for this podcast, I you know I I just did a Google search on. Why f is fear used so much in political campaigns? And if I came across this great white paper um, done by a psychologist. And basically, fear motivates people two times more than uh, not using fear in a message, which is why we get so inundated as advisors from our clients. We get so inundated with messages of, hey, did you read this article about U.S. is not going to be the world-dominated currency in the next ten, in the next ten years? And you have to watch an hour and a half <laughs> YouTube video, and then in the end, it's all this fear, fear, fear at the end. And then what do they want you to do? They want you to buy something. They want the you end. to buy something, right? <laughs> I saw that coming. <laughs> so it, it's um, uh, the same with with. You know, articles even in the Wall Street Journal. You know, they'll they'll talk about how value is going to be the way for growth stocks can't sustain this this bull market that they're in, and it's kind of find out it's written by uh, a value fund manager. There you go. So in the end, um, they're using fear to say, "Oh my gosh, what's been working for a decade is not going to work," and therefore you got to buy our product. Mm -hmm. um, so. You, it, it, it's uh, it's sad that it's that way. You know, you'd hope that you could be you could run a presidential campaign that's built on hope in the future and how things are going to change. And but no one really does that. They say, if you don't vote for me, your taxes are going to double. Your, <laughs> you know, right. um, and, and and but that's just how the human brain's wired. Um, it, it's our it's our uh, I guess you know fight or flight mechanism. That's what I was just thinking. It probably goes way back. Yeah. And that's why, was, why we survived, you know, a long time ago. Exactly. You know? Exactly. So you just have to understand that, that that's why they do it. it it's, not, it's not necessarily because, um, uh, you know, the candidate's necessarily negative. Uh, it's just that's the message that seems to move people to the polls to vote one way, one way or, the, or the other. So now we, 
you know, we're in a situation, we've talked about this in podcasts before, we, we're in a situation where right now Trump's leading the um, 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 primaries, for Republican primaries by, uh, I believe the last time I looked, it was it was over 25%. Um, then you have an incumbent, Biden, who says that he plans on running. So essentially right now, as we look at it today, we potentially have a repeat of 2020, which was very chaotic to say the least. Right. Um, maybe, maybe the Republicans will see the light that, Hey, all we have to do is, you know, produce a young person, a younger person. I say young, someone in their seventies would be young. This <laughs> current part of these guys. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and you get a shoe in pretty much. I feel like, um, same with in the, in the democratic, campaign if, if they you know, chose a a, uh, a different candidate that was um, able to complete a, a message maybe maybe that would be a shoe in for for that side um someone who's pretty clean right but regardless what happens we we get our our emotions get wrapped up in all this and we start thinking oh if we don't elect my candidate then the whole country's going to go to hell and I just got to be out of the portfolios. We've had this conversation with, with someone earlier in the year. You did, you know, just don't like direction of this country. I'm taking everything to cash. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's not, it's not rational thinking. You're not using data to solve any of your problems. You're, you're simply using your emotions and nothing else. And that that's not successful investing. Right. Right. We talk about all the time in this podcast that, you know, finan financial success is intentional. It's it's a mindset setting goals. It's it's not just hoarding money. <laughs> it's learning how to build wealth, right? And that that's that's the part that you know that's the part that said okay, let's go ahead and and throw this out there now to put the back of people's minds is as we approach election season, let's look at data. What does the data say about who's in charge of the country? Which which um, which party? Right. Because, again, we're only looking at it from an economic standpoint. We're not looking at it from from a um, morality standpoint. <laughs> from we're not looking in, for it from a know, political standpoint. Or, from, yes, you know, correct. No, an agenda. Yeah, no. We don't care about abortion. We don't care about any of these other things that you vote for when you go to vote. We're only focused today on economics. And so my question is, if you're a Democrat or Republican... There's differences in taxation, obviously, but how do, how are tax revenues generated? From, by by from companies and income yeah. <laughs> made by companies and individuals. Yeah, yes. right. So someone's got to be making money, yeah. right? Or else, what is it? What does it even matter at that point? Yeah. Um, that's a very simplistic view of it. And obviously, there's you know how do we tax the top one percent in the country? There's always those debates. Um, tax rates could could obviously jump to be higher. Um, those are all things that you vote for, but we're only talking about economics, your portfolio, right? Right. And there's been high tax rate decades where the markets did just fine. And there's been low tax rates where the market hasn't done well. <laughs> it goes back and forth, right? There's so many factors that go into... Uh, to go into this, and that brings up a good point. As we as we have this discussion, you know, it's just a single factor. It's just some data on a very narrow slice of investing. Okay, and we're not saying that decisions need to be made exclusively with this data. Right. We're just saying that data can be collected and arranged in such a way that you can make a point. Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about here. So let's kind of hop into it. Um, there's a, what they call the presidential election cycle theory. So we're only talking about presidents right now, not right. who controls Congress. Correct. So why don't you explain this to me, Brad? Well, an author by the name of Yale Hirsch came up with this. He, he uh, authors a book, uh, he's gone now, but his son has taken over, but he authored a book called the stock market, um, almanac. And what he did is collected data over years and years and years and years on the stock market and then created, based upon dissecting that data, looked for trends, and then 
back tested them and then produced the the hypothesis in much the way you go through an experiment and then has created these different types of um, um, theories that exist in the stock market today. The one that we're going to talk about is the presidential election year cycle. Other ones were the Santa Claus rally. We've oh, right. all heard about it. Yeah, I'll talk that, about that. Yeah, yeah that, this was developed by, by Yale Hirsch as well in the uh, stock market almanac. So in the presidential year cycle, uh, election year cycle, Yale looked at these different years in an administration, the first year, the second year, the third year, and the fourth year. Wasn't concerned necessarily about where we're at in the election cycle, but rather in the administrations itself. And what he found through looking at stock market data exclusively related to the S&P 500. So that's the limit, okay? He was not talking about balanced portfolios. He was talking about individual stocks. He's talking about an index of 500 companies, okay, that he could use the data to look to see if there was a trend related to in, in a presidential cycle, And what he found, and this was very interesting, and it's been used from time to time, okay, uh, for uh, uh, conversation's sake. According to his theory, okay, after entering the Oval Office, the chief executive has a tendency to work on their most deeply held policy proposals and indulge the special interests of those who got them elected. So in the first year or two of an election, excuse me, an, an administration, they're working towards putting together proposals and enacting legislation that they ran their campaign on. Okay, and it tends to be the most, um, uh, uh, what should I say? Uh, interesting is not the word. What will be the right word here? Not, um, uh, but rather uh, controversial. Okay, leaning towards one party or the other's value system. Okay, and during that time period, there is some uncertainty that's caused by this. It's uncertainty in the taxation, uncertainty in regulations, and so on. So, as businesses and individuals begin to work through this cycle of new proposals and new legislation, that uncertainty causes for investors to have less confidence in the market and the returns. Over time, the data long-term, going back to 1933, show that in the first two years of a a presidential administration, the returns are lower. In the third year of a presidential administration, what happens is the president begins to recognize that in order to get re-elected, and if he's in the second term, in order to get a member of the same party re-elected, they begin to introduce new legislation and new spending programs to stimulate the economy to enhance the value of of, uh, the stock market, generate more jobs, and increase the feeling of we're better off now that we're in this this type of administration cycle here. And so in the third year of of an administration, historically, we see the best returns. I'm going to go through these in in a second here. And then in the fourth year, the president generally has to take his eye off the ball a little bit, and he goes out and does a lot of campaigning. And as well, now there's uncertainty back in the market because there's an election coming up. We don't know who's going to be in the White House the following year. So that uncertainty causes investors to have less confidence again and stock market returns are not as high. So in the year after an election, on average since 1933, the year after an election, the stock market has gone up 6.7%. These are actual data. In the second year, it's up 5.8% on average. In the third year, we see a bump, on average, 16.3% return in the S&P 500. And in the fourth year, we're looking back at, a again, a less confident investor base and a return of 6.7%. So it appears that there is indeed a bump that occurs in that third year and is generally explained in the vernacular, it's just it's the power of the purse. The president and Congress can act work together to get their person elected 
ready for the next election cycle. And so they're releasing as many funds as they can in to stimulate the economy. Okay. Now, these are just stock market returns. So let's see, compare it to regardless of presidential election cycle. Since 1933, the stock market, and we've talked about this on podcast, is up 7 out of 10 years or 70% of the time. Right. Okay. But let's take a look at those particular years. Let's look at that third year. In that third year, it's up 82% of the time. So it increases above the average, not just the average return, which outsized returns can move the average. Now the average of positive years in that third year is higher than the average of all years. So in a couple different ways, we can look at this and say, you know, in the third year of, of the presidential's term, there may be, you know, an opportunity for investors to take advantage of that. Now, every year is different. Every year is circumstantial. So that's, we'll just kind of have yeah, to see. That's taking, that's taking just the S&P and comparing it only to the election cycle. That's correct. Where and, has, and we're looking at causation <laughs> versus correlation, you know, yeah, et cetera. Has, <clears throat> has nothing on economic growth, interest rates, productivity, innovation. Doesn't count for any of that, right? No, nope. It's just data. Just, yeah. yeah. And so... Is it actually correlated? Is that third year ac- actually correlated perfectly? Not really, because no. I, I, you know, even I think in his in his article or in his book, he even said that there's outlying factors that will happen, and there always will be. And really, did it cause? Did the pre- did the administration actually cause that third year to be better? Yeah, than the other year. So is it causation right. versus correlation? You know. It's just a pattern that someone saw. It's a pattern someone saw. Okay. And and in the end, it doesn't mean that that pattern always continues. No. Right? Or, mm-hmm. uh, and it, we're certainly not going to use it to make investment decisions. Okay? No. <laughs> but this is what some of the things that get floated out there that, that people hear about, you know. It just reminds me, like, my, my you read that, and you go, oh, that's interesting. But I go back to the saying, you know, it's time in the market is more important than timing the market, right? Right. So it's it's your overall time that you have money invested. You know, because I go back to, you know, investing for one year in the S and P five hundred is kind of kind of dangerous, really. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Five years is a lot better. Ten years is never lost money. Twenty years is worst case scenario. I think was a five percent rate of return. And in this is you know th- this data occurs only in an all equity portfolio. Yeah, right. You know, and and who does that? Yeah, that's true. Well, Vanguard Vanguard chimed in on this as well. Um, this is the data that I that I pulled down for today, and you know, basically, um, you know, they're saying in a balanced portfolio that presidential elections don't have any long term effects on on um, uh, portfolio performance, uh, and that data goes all the way back, you know, more than half a century. Um, and actually they say that U S equity volatility in the months preceding and following a presidential election has been lower, um, than experienced during non-election years. Mm -hmm. So they don't see any correlation. Now this is, this is only referring it to market volatility, not rate of return necessarily, but just how volatile the markets are. Um, you know, I, I remember when Trump was elected in 2020, the futures tanked, futures down over a remember thousand that? points. Yes, uh, I literally remember Car Icon on Fox News. He was being interviewed, and they said, "Hey, Mr. Icon, you, you know the futures are down a thousand points." And he was he was like, "Oh, I didn't know that. No, I've just been enjoying the evening." And and um, he's like, okay. And, and then the interview cut out. And uh, later, I saw him interviewed again. This couple years later, and uh, he says. Uh, you know, Mr. Icon, you know, this uh, 2020 election is, is our, uh, uh, that would be the, what? Uh, 2016. Yeah, 2016 election. Mm-hmm. It's uh, 2016, uh, you know, election hour approaching 2020. And he says, uh, you know, how do you plan on profiting? So I've already profited. And he's told a story. He goes, well, I learned from you guys on the air that the futures were down. So I, I went and bought a bunch of futures. I, I ran home and bought a bunch of futures. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he made he made a lot of money yeah. uh, that night. So, yeah. but by the time the market actually opened, it didn't, it didn't, uh, on, I mean, if you look back at history, you know, on the timeline, it didn't open uh, significantly up or down right. uh, the next day. Um, so 
you know, it, it's uh, really, you know, when it comes down to all this is when you're in investing, you, you just have to have clear goals. I don't know that a portfolio strategy built on politics um, is ever a good goal. Um, you're usually working toward something long-term, rate of uh, income, uh, income in the future, or you're trying to just maintain your wealth for the next generation. Um, you want to make sure that your portfolios are well diversified. So we use uh, ETF portfolios here. We hold about 6,700 stocks, about 10,000 bonds. We're not worried about going to zero, um, but we can control volatility by how we how we move around amongst those asset classes. Uh, you want to keep your costs low. Average costs of our portfolios here are 0 0.08 of a percent per year. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very important. I think in this day and age, uh, all portfolios ought to be less than 10 basis points or, or one-tenth of a percent. If not, you're paying too much. Um, and then you have to take a long-term view. So you, you, it's frustrating. It's frustrating probably you know, to open up a statement and see loss after loss after loss, which seems like it's going to last forever. But we've talked about this before in times of crisis, it, is that when you're going through something, it feels like you've been through it forever, but that's not the reality. The reality is it's just a season, right? Mm -hmm. And election year is just a season. Exactly. It happens uh, mm -hmm. yep. like winter every <laughs> every single year. Yeah, it does. Um, but it is, it is a season, and I feel like 24 is going to be more nasty than in the past. Um, I, I, you know, I, the Trump has some really good and implemented some really good economic policies, but what I'm most disturbed about is – his ability to just be flat out rude and, and target people. And then now that has become uh, a constant in politics. You know, people will just say the meanest, nastiest things about each other. Um, and uh, that's okay now. And it also detracts. It detracts from the conversation that needs to be had between politicians right. so that the voting public can discern and make a decision because Correct. they're just distracted by the, the comments, right? Yeah, you know, right. And the behavior. Um, you know, Brad, you, you printed off this great diagram here. Uh, yeah, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> basically, it's a diagram of of Republican, and it's a, so it's an elephant, it's a donkey, and basically uh, potential outcomes. So you have House, Senate, White House. So if if it's uh, a, a, if it's split, so you have donkey and and elephant, yeah. <laughs> everything's split. We have a divided government. Uh, which the implications are policy gridlock, but it's market friendly. Markets yes. do well during po uh, periods of split government. They do. We saw that during the Clinton years, actually. Mm -hmm. um, if Democrats control or if Republicans control everything, either one, uh, you have policy consensus, but you get a lot of short term volatility because there's probably a lot of change right. happening all, all at one right. time. And it's difficult for investors to keep up with it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, Bottom line is you you should never build a portfolio that is built toward one particular um, uh, government's policy. Whoever's in charge, whatever the gov government policy. Right now, you know, there's uh, with Larry Fink uh, and all the BlackRock people that are in the White House now uh, working for working for Biden and pushing through the BlackRock agenda. Um, you know, their big thing was ESG. ESG. Probably it was not dead on arrival. People still have millions of dollars in these things. Although there's been a cons considerably uh, large withdrawals from from ESG funds because people realize they're paying five times for the same performance and holding the S and P 500 with the same stocks. <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. Um, if if your financial advisor is using ESG funds, I would run. They're not. They're they're just pandering to maybe what you asked for, but. They're, they're, they didn't tell you the truth. They didn't tell you the whole thing was a scam. The SEC is starting a big investigation on that, too. They are. So many funds are saying ESG, but they're not ESG. Right. You know? Yeah. You know, they're represented through their name, but right. they're not actually performing the task of an ESG manager. There is the ESG has um, been kind of quiet lately. It's yeah. kind of interesting that as we're moving into this election cycle, that ESG has kind of quieted off just a little bit. It's, to, it's no different than low volatility funds, which became more volatile than the S and P. It's no different than yeah. all the other you know funds that pop up. Great marketing, people people buy into it, and then it all kind of fades away. Yeah, the classics are still here, still yeah. making money. That's it. Um, you know, ESG branding reminds me of uh, 
there's this little airline. I don't know if they still in existence or not, but they'd fly a Cessna caravan with a turboprop engine. So it's a propeller and it, you'd board it at Hartsfield and you would fly it to Chattanooga. And they went to like Columbus, Georgia. I mean, some other little short runs holds so at 16 people, you know, two pilots, no flight attendant. And on the side of the airplane, cause people see a prop and they see a single engine prop. It kind of freaked out, right? They had the perfect marketing play on the side of the plane. They wrote, Echo jet. <laughs> Echo jet. Yeah. And I'm like, that's a prop. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can but, call it whatever you want, but it's a prop. <laughs> it's a prop. Uh, it's a turbine. It's still a turbine, much like a jet engine. But but to make people feel better, they go, oh, it's, it's a jet. It's just an Echo jet with a prop on the front. You, you have no idea what they're talking about. That's what ESG is. ESG investing is putting a different label in the S&P 500 and, and charging five times as much and Anyway, so, um, yeah, the, the bottom line is as we approach 24, just remember that the portfolios could be more volatile, but you're a long-term investor. You're focused well past whoever you're electing as president. Your money has to work longer than that, right? Right. And I always tell people, too, that, that if, um, if capitalism's on the ballot, then we'd probably be uh, – thinking how to hedge, <laughs> how to hedge that, right? But capitalism really has never been on the ballot. No one's ever said, we're not going to be the comp- the country that people come to to start businesses. We're not going to um, uh, be a free enterprise. No one has ever said that. Um, I mean, there's education systems in other countries are probably way better than what we have in the U.S., but yet our free market system wins every single time. And I think ultimately that that's what you have to focus on um, because in this next, next cycle is going to be very polarized with a lot of nastiness, I believe. I think it's inevitable that it'll be one of the more nasty cycles. Um, we've kind of devolved into this, and I think that election uh, politicians recognize that it's they can do this and get away with it. Because yeah. in the past couple cycles, they've gotten nastier and nastier, but somebody still gets elected. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And a lot of good people, unfortunately, a lot of good people sit on the sidelines. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> and I agree with you completely. <laughs> There's no incentive. There's just no incentive to, to, to become um, someone working for the people right now. Uh, thanks for listening to today's episode. If you're interested in learning more about Wiser Wealth Management or want to schedule a consultation to meet with one of our fiduciary financial advisors, you can do so by going to wiserinvestor.com or you can click on the link in the episode notes. A uh, couple things to remember. We have a YouTube channel called A Wiser Retirement. In our episode notes, we've, also, we've linked to uh, a video on how to be a long-term investor, uh, what's the right time to invest in the stock market. Those are two great videos. Uh, that, that, that second one there, Brad, is not uh, what you think it would be. You, you would think that you'd have to time your entry, but um, always amazed to see that Vanguard report stating that it doesn't matter when you enter, you just got to be in it. Yes. Uh, so much, so much of investments is derived by income. Uh, podcast, other podcasts you might want to download five principles to successful investing. That's episode 165 and then episode 89. One of my favorites, active versus passive investing. Uh, this is episode 169. Amazing. I remember the first one. That's right. Yeah. You and I, well, here right. we are again. Here we are again. That's later. right. All right. Uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you guys next week. Great. Thanks for listening to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss any new episodes. We'd also appreciate if you could leave a rating and review. If you have any questions about anything that was discussed today, head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out. This episode was produced and edited by Ken Hopley.